Morning. Can I welcome everyone to the third meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? Can I please remind everyone, including myself, present to turn off mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? I have received apologies from Richard Lockhead this morning. The first item of business is the decision on whether to take item five on a work programme in private. Are we all agreed? Great. Thank you. The second item of business today is on the Commission on Widening Access, and I welcome to the meeting three members of that commission. Dame Ruth Silver, the Chair. Maureen McKenna, the Executive Director of Education Services at Glasgow City Council. And Professor Petra Wend, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of Queen Margaret University. Dame Silver, I understand that you've agreed to make an opening statement outlining the work of the Commission. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted to be here. I've been longing to, to, to come before you and, and, and help open up this uh, uh, swiftly written, um, slightly dense, uh, but I think very crucial report. We had 10 months to do it in, and uh, my colleagues were, were incredibly industrious and, uh, and supportive. But um, if it's OK, I'd like to um, start by telling you what we found at the end of our investigations, which led us to make the recommendations that we've made. And so after um, literally scurrying around the whole of Scotland, and people were generous and hospitable to visits from all of us, on some of us, and came to see us from far from parts of, uh, uh, of Scotland to tell us their thoughts and their experience of access. And the conclusion, this is a headline, but happy to go into it in more detail if that suits, was that actually Scotland knows how to do this. Actually, it knows how to do it very well. But it is in a difficult developmental stage. The work that we came across, um, uh, in some cases inspiring, um, was innovative in many institutions, uh, uh, based on um, a dedication, I think, to this work. And my own, my own personal and professional standpoint is that access work is a specialism in its own right, in the way that physics and, and other things are. The pedagogy is important, the development of staff is important, and actually the portability of the experience via, via credentials is crucial to this area of work. Um, however, the state uh, that it's in at the moment is uh, in, in, in some parts exciting and in some parts very frail and in some parts stale. And I say that because I went to every visit and, and saw everybody. It, uh, it is heavily dependent in, on inspired individuals who really believe in the cause of access. Uh, it is institutionally based, so what's a terrific practice in one institution is very different from practice down the road. Uh, and sometimes there's duplicate practice and sometimes um, the portability between very neighbouring institutions is not quite, uh, quite right. Um, the deficit on the whole is placed on the ind individual learner instead of deficits in the institutional behaviours. But the good news is that a decade of terrific professional practice in access work, and there's layers of good professionals who just need pulling together around some overall framework. And I think that was the state of, the, uh, of what we were looking at. Um, uh, to remind the Commission that we decided to go for an appreciative inquiry so we wanted to see what worked. That was part of our remit, was to see what good practice could be, could be um, taken further. So with that conclusion, let me kind of just say a wee bit to open up uh, this report, because it, uh, as I say, it was, I should say, I'm sorry we wrote you, wrote you a long report, but didn't have time to write you a short one. It's really quite simple. So in that spirit, um, um, uh, I'm glad to be here today, especially uh, uh, to open up the report a bit with the help of my colleagues who uh, uh, have been introduced. And the timing's terrific because actually the report is ready to move forward with the appointment of Professor Scott. To remind you, to trail back the origins of this commission was a statement from the First Minister who said, I determine that a child born today from difficult circumstances will have equal access uh, to going to university as uh, children born in, in, in better circumstance. And the verb determine was particularly inspiring and very cohesive, I think, for the Commission. 
uh, that was a good lifetime, good lifespan. So we worked with a, with a kind of uh, imagined uh, horizon of 2030, and that chunked into three five-year plans because the development stages are different. The first one is about gathering together good practice, shaking it about to see what's good enough and what isn't and what should be removed, and then moving forward with the agenda we set out in our 34 recommendations. Um, just to say that 12 good people uh, joined me around the table, and the first thing we did was induct one another. It's a very important reason, um, and working with the civil servants, to get the kind of commission I thought was needed to give a 360-degree look at access. Because it's not just access to education, it's access onwards to economic life. And we wanted to reflect uh, employer views and so on. So we were able to find 12 people who were there in their own um, independent professional rights, but who also represented the subsystems around the work of access, schools, universities, um, uh, skills development and so on, um, uh, the care community, the students themselves and staff themselves. We worked in our induction phase on what the philosophy of the Commission was, and I'll, I'll say it because it's really important. Uh, there were many accusations in the press about social engineering and so on. But our philosophy is a simple one, that access, work and education is simply about fairness. That it is also about a belief in academic excellence for all. And it's a social and economic good for the nation. Our working principles, we had five of them, were that our work would be systemic, appreciative, analytic, evidence-based and collaborative. <clears throat> The root of the Commission having been established and with the com commissioners in place and inducted and, and themselves representing something systemic, an agreed philosophy, the organising principles established, we launched a call for evidence for over the summer and we commissioned research pro bono, given pro, on a pro bono basis from the universities to look at what was going on in, in access in Scotland. Um, we had a working process established where we met monthly. There were themed meetings. We had visitors from the different subsystems and, uh, and students themselves and the care uh, specialists come to talk to us. Uh, many visitors came. We made many visits into some very cold parts of um, Scotland in wet evenings and waiting for trains and stations. Um, and we were absolutely available, all of us, to talk at events. Uh, I was very heartened by the number of invitations that we got from membership bodies and representative bodies, including trade unions generally and, uh, of course, the professional unions. I asked one thing of the commissioners, that each of them would steward an interest uh, uh, on, on the agenda. So, for example, um, we had uh, uh, people working on different parts of it. We looked at um, SIMD with joint working parties, we had missions, uh, and so on. So there was always a steward available to, be, to, to talk to, to explain things actually to our own colleagues. And indeed, we had the induction with our own members uh, telling us what was going on. We uh, set up, in the end, a group of um, specialist groups uh, uh, and I'll say more about that. Uh, but I want to mention them for the sake of the, uh, the Commissioner, because the idea always was that we will have specialist groups to advise us, and they were not uh, commissioners, they were people from the field, and mixed people from the field in terms of sectors they came from. But we wanted to leave scaffolding for the future so that when the Commissioner was appointed, there were groups there who had explored the themes, the working papers exist, or they're, they're not published uh, in, in hard copy. So there was a dowry of something to pass on in, a, in the spirit of generativity. And of course we had the um, interim and final report and then the handover. Uh, the stance we took uh, as we did this work was uh, again a simple one. Inequality is damaging, it's unsustainable and it's unfair and it was time it stopped. Uh, the work process, as I said, was 10 months, and our organising principles with the commissioners um, were that they were independent, they were specialist, and they were linked backwards into their own areas of work and institutions uh, and around our table. Uh, as I said, we tried to create the system around the table. We had arguments, unable to resolve them. Some of them it will take a while, but also the time scale was very short indeed. But with the arguments, I uh, tried to maintain a chairship of them not being personal, 
but being issues between the subsystems. So staying curious the whole time and, and trying to get on there. As I've said, um, we were delighted that Scotland knew how terrific professionals and practices some groundbreaking systems. The systems here that I've not seen the like of anywhere, but they are in the institution and uh, modest as uh, the institutions are, they don't get talked about much elsewhere and that has to stop. Um, and actually, more than anything else, this sincerity of intent. Um, the problem you have is actually they're not all the same, they're not all connected and some of them need refreshing. Uh, the conclusion was, innovative as things are, they are idiosyncratic in Scotland, and that needs to change. This focus on the individual's deficit, the territory of institutions. There were cities where I saw three summer schools, and it could have been one, and it could have been wonderful, and it could have had pe young people meeting people who were different from them. Um, it is unsystemic, and it's an easy move, I think, from institution to unsystemic in planning terms. Of course, it takes time. Um, it, uh, there's a lack of portability in the system and the uh, data is poor uh, to, to inadequate, I think. It was very hard uh, because of the way it's organised and that became a, a big issue uh, that needs to be picked up soon. Um, but Scotland also has untapped gifts. I'm thinking of the Open University, where deputy head teachers were able to find uh, units of philosophy from students from very difficult areas, and they would present those to universities and actually get the credit for that. So some smashing defiance mm -hmm. in your institutions. So the strategic shift that Scotland needs to make is clear for me. It is from individual passions to institutional change. It's from institutions to a system at work um, and uh, at work together, of course, and um, a place, a place being the focus of that. So people working together, institutions working together, better, I think, gets a lot of uh, bangs for bucks. Um, I know there's a lot of recommendations, uh, and I've explained why. Um, uh, but really, they categorise, I think, into three very helpful categories. We talked about the leadership of this system change, including political leadership. We talked about the access is about learning. It's not about funding or cutting deals. It's really about how do you manage the teaching and learning and assessment in institutions so that actually it shows people for the talents that they have. And, and it's about finding the places of leverage. There were 34 recommendations. Not all recommendations are equal in my view, um, but there are some foundation recommendations. Uh, and let me just uh, say what they are. There's eight foundation recommendations. Um, that is recommendation one, the commissioner and the leadership of this change, and that's happened. Commission two is about the framework for fair access. If this isn't about learning, if it's not about what's being taught and assessed and portable, then it's not going to work. Learning needs to be looked at and, and pruned and supported. Um, it's about um, uh, the uh, framework for fair access. It's about funding being congruent with the fair funding for fair access. In time, it, we should not be supporting work that's not leading anywhere for the learners. Um, access thresholds, of course, those are um, separate and ambitious. But those have to be looked at because learners presenting are presenting from very different routes and very, from very different opportunities. And I think we're clear about that. Um, that doesn't mean it's not, we, we're very aware of the disputes, but nevertheless, uh, the view of the Commission was that that should go forward. Th the threshold and contextual admissions are the important ones. They need to be known, they need to be published and acted upon. Care experience, um, we were delighted at the instant response from government, actually on a few of the recommendations, and particularly that one. Um, the non-refundable bursary uh, for care experience learners is crucial as well. And the targets need to be worked at in line with this development sense of uh, uh, the five-year plan. All of the other 26 recommendations have three intentions, to strengthen the work that needs to be done, to support the work that needs to be done and to stretch the findings into all the institutions involved in access. I know we're going to talk about priorities going forward um, and maybe I'll leave that for, for other colleagues to contribute as well. But I hope that, that opens up for you some of the thinking in that 10 months, some of our ways of working, the things we believed in. And I'm very happy to um, 
uh, to, to open up and take questions along with my colleagues. Thank you very much, Dame Silver. Uh, I was, I'm always delighted to hear somebody who says they were really looking forward to coming in front of the, 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 the committee. Uh, I have a, a question based on comments you had made previously. Uh, it appears obvious to me that you were right when you said it simply can't be the case. The large majority of Scotland's best talent happens to reside in our most affluent areas. But what evidence is there to show that the bright pupils from depressed areas uh, can do just as well or better than their more affluent peers, even if their qualifications aren't as good? I don't have the references to hand, but certainly the, uh, the report from, um, from Sutton, some of the work done in Scotland shows that actually um, coming from a disadvantaged uh, um, uh, background, and I'm talking about school backgrounds as well, when these young people are treated, taught, assessed, and in the company of, uh, of others uh, on the same course, they do very well indeed. So there's, there is evidence, not enough, and we need more of that. And that's why uh, this, the sense of five-year plan, I think, is to say, let's start getting the basis for that. I know my colleague has got a, a number of questions around data and stuff, but just one uh, last question on that, then. Is there any evidence to suggest the money lost to the economy because we aren't at this stage getting those people into university that, that could be benefiting the um, th there's evidence from other places, uh, England certainly, about the cost to the economy of these young people, uh, n you know, not getting, not doing uh, as well as they could do. The sort of support systems, how hard jobs are to find, and actually some of the the issues that they're facing. Uh, again, you know, in the ten months we had, we didn't have enough uh, time or staff to really get under the skin of that. Sure, that's but there, true. There, there is evidence from other places. Thank you, my well, colleagues. Good morning. Um, I wonder if I can pursue this issue about uh, data. Uh, you were very clear indeed uh, in the information that we received about some of the ambitions of what uh, you are flagging up to the uh, Commission, and that includes uh, a shared understanding of the barriers. I think that's uh, extremely important, and we've got a list here of uh, eight uh, barriers that have been suggested as being really key to this issue. Um, I'm actually quite interested in the data that supports uh, your findings in this area, and obviously on a broader uh, issue, how that data supports the decision by the Scottish Government to uh, insist that universities will accept uh, in their intake 20% from the disadvantaged communities by 2030. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, your concerns over data, which you highlighted in your own introduction and in your answer just to the convener just now? Because well, this committee has sat through uh, a lot of education evidence recently, particularly about the curriculum for excellence, and it was a point that was raised by the OECD and by lots of experts in Scotland that the actual data that we need is not really all that great. And if you don't have the good data, it's very difficult for the committee to make decisions about uh, scrutiny and deciding what the policy uh, should be. So can I just ask about this data problem? What is it that we are missing that would help you better to inform uh, this committee and obviously the wider public about what we should be doing? I, mean, I, I, think it, <coughs> excuse me, I think it suffers generally from the same disease that, that is not systemic. There's very good data in strands about particular sectors. <coughs> excuse me, so for example, uh, we, we, we were surprised to find that the exchange of data between, for example, the Funding Council and the Inspector and some of the local authorities and some of the, the central body, some of the civil service itself, there was no way of it working together. People didn't know a lot of the data that other people heard. And actually, uh, and, and they, once, once we got them together, they worked well together. But they had never had cause, common cause, to do that before. Can I just ask about that? Because you, you, in your introduction, you said that you thought some of the data, uh, the collection of data was poor. Is it a question that we don't actually have the available data to hand? Or is it a question about communicating that data? I think it's both, actually. Um, so, and Scotland's been through a lot of uh, uh, kind of febrile time in policy change in education. So um, the kind of linking the early years uh, data um, I think is now strengthened and being established, but, but it didn't go back far enough. So, so there's difference in the time scale, there's difference in the kind of concepts used behind that. And, and we, we were surprised because we, we, um, certainly the, the, the team and I tried to find some information, found that teams inside the funding council 
had the data. They had them in regional data, some of it was regional, some of it was national. So there's just something about taking the chance to have an overarching framework where different sets of data can talk to one another. This isn't just Scotland's problem, by the way. We, I, I sit in a group at the Royal Society looking at how we can bring, you know, now that we have uh, you know, super data uh, and whatnot, how we can bring that together. So it's a problem generally uh, in England as well and, and in other places. Um, but, but there's something that the changes have all happened, some of the data hasn't happened, some of the data has been developed uh, in different ways. And I'm, I'm saying, you know, have a look at that seriously. Um, institutions have their own data, local authorities have theirs, to serve the, the reports they have to make to, to their politicians and so on, and to, to government. I, I think Professor uh, Vend wants to come in. Could, could I just ask one more question, Kamina, before that? Um, I, th I think our, our issue is that uh, we've obviously got your excellent recommendations, and this is a, a very important issue. I, I don't think anybody disagrees with the principle behind widening access. I, I don't think there's uh, any disagreement about that whatsoever. There are some disagreements about how it should happen. And it's very important that in that debate about how it should happen, that the data which underpins the decisions that are made is comprehensive, that it's coherent, that it's consistent, and it's as uh, valuable as we possibly can. Because otherwise, I think we will be in danger of pursuing policies without the factual basis that we really need, and particularly from a scrutiny angle. W would you accept that? And we had a, a specialist group looking at that, a joint working party with University of Scotland and civil servants and, and, uh, and some of our commissioners, and again chaired by an independent commissioner uh, from the Sutton Trust. And there's working parties going on in lots of places, and I think they moved that forward. I know work has, has gone on since we finished the commission, and um, some parts of the system have taken that up further. For that being available? Sorry. Maureen? Can I come in uh, um, and bring to the committee's attention? The University of Glasgow and West of Scotland um, Local Authority Partners published a report in December 2016 um, on the back of, of really taking all the data that was available and drilling right down from 2009 to 2015 about impact for access, and that's sitting with the SFC just now, and I would recommend it to the committee to read so it's that a very good published. report. Yes, it's published. Yeah, I know it's published because I've read it, but yeah. it, will, it be, will there be a wider... Uh, dissemination of that because I think it, it strikes at the heart of what Dame Silver was saying about the uh, the issue about good data being sometimes out there but not necessarily available to all the people who, who need it and particularly not in, in terms of, of, of this committee. What I wanted to add is, is there is a different or another aspect to data as well which is the definition interpretation of what deprivation means and the report makes recommendations in terms of SMD and has got targets for 2030 and beforehand as well. And we did realize that SMD is not the, the right way to measure deprivation because two out of three deprived uh, children live in non-SMD 20 areas. And this is what we need to realize as well. And this is one of our recommendations is that there should be a unique learner number allocated to each child, whereby we could actually follow the progression of the child through life in order to measure long-term where uh, our successes are and where interventions can succeed. Obviously, we are not there yet. We haven't even started yet. So in the absence of that, we, our targets were in SIMD, but we had a special session on, on deprivation and data in, in that context as well. And University of Scotland for a long time has worked on, on a definition of, of deprivation and looked at a basket of measures. And, and this is something we need to take on in the absence of SMD being the only measurable way of, of looking at it. Yeah. Hey, Joanne, you want to come in on that point? Just briefly on this question of SMID, except it's not the only measure, but would, did you not find that there is an issue about concentration of deprivation within a community impacting on the, the ability of schools to deliver services, for example, and therefore a young person who themselves are very supported, perhaps they have reasonable income in the family, but learning in that school will have different pressures than a school which doesn't have that. And therefore, it is an important... I mean, it's not just about the individual child. It's a cumulative effect of deprivation on the services within mm. the communities in which they're learning. No, you, I completely agree with you, but it cannot be the only measure. There's a lot of deprivation in rural areas, which we need to look at, and they are not in SIMD 20. So we're talking about a basket of measures, which includes SIMD. It, it, we need to take Did into account... Do you accept that there is a question of 
the impact on a school and its ability to, to support the young people in the school in, in a community which is deprived because the pressures are on it that won't happen in other areas. And I accept the point about mm -hmm. rurality, and I think there are other factors that can be used to measure that, but there is a very specific question around the learner journey, which is about the pressures on that class or in that, in that community. Yes. yes. Thank you, Gillian. You're coming in. You want to come in on this point? You, you've touched on what I was going to ask you about. I come from a rural constituency <clears throat> uh, up in the northeast of Scotland. Obviously, Aberdeen University and Robert Gordon University have made recommendations to you and, and asked about this. Yeah, and I, I specifically want to ask what's come out of that discussion about where you have potential students who would qualify that are getting missed because they're not in those SIMD areas. What criteria have you added to the mix there that maybe could identify those students that may be living in a street, be living in a town that looks on the surface of it fairly affluent, but in that particular household there are issues there. How, I'm interested to know what your findings were there. To add at a basket of measures, I think they included four or five. Now, I can't uh, recall them all, but uh, low-performing schools was part of that because it isn't always the case that low-performing uh, schools are in, in SMD20 areas. Free school meals, I think we looked at as well. What else did we look at? Um, family histories of attendance, HE, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the number of uh, pupils that... that's the school sent on into higher education, so the, school, the school's success at higher education, yeah. parent How, success. Well, yeah, absolutely. However, However, I would say that, that we didn't come to a conclusion that those were the, the right basket of indicators. You know, the, the Commission didn't have, as Dame Ruth has already said, didn't have the time to be able to take those indicators and be able to say, oh yeah, for sure, let's use that one, let's use that one. Um, I think that... Uh, uh, that there, there still is a lot of work needed done in that area, and I think there still is a view, and it, it came through in the evidence to the committee today, that the role of the admissions officer is still a very critical one um, around what a <coughs> contextualised admission would be, and, and that relationship, and I think it, it's the, the, the tension between the institutional-based approach getting a systemic approach and then allowing those individual circumstances that are really necessary to be taken into consideration because you're absolutely right. You know, the, the rural dimension um, is, is a very important one and it's not to say that there's not deprivation and not challenges for those young people and those families living in a rural area and therefore it's the school um, who would know that information? And how does the school get that link into the admissions officer? How does the admissions officer have time to sift in amongst all that plethora of information that comes in? And that's where we do need to get better at getting a systemic approach, but also not forgetting each and every young person that we want to show that has the potential out there, because that's the fairness element that comes out from the commission. In a view of those universities, it could look, for example, like University of Aberdeen may have hidden individuals that, because they're not identified as being from those areas, that they look like they're not meeting any kind of target that's been that others are. I agree with you. Uh, University of Scotland, we've already started with three work streams, and one of them is on admissions. And we are particularly looking at contextualised admissions, but also at the various criteria we want to use for contextualised admission. And we want to agree on a framework for that across all universities. So we are going to look further into that. Thank you very much. Can, can, I, can I just uh, say that actually SIMD was not designed to help people choose young people. SIMD is a measure that, that has another intention. It's been used elsewhere. It's a monitoring measure more than anything else. And it's why we badly need uh, what the, the work that's going on on um, contextual admissions. And what we've given you as examples are simply that. They are hypotheses. The work, you know, the work needs to start. And um, the work that's going on, the working groups set up, are self-authorising in a way. And I'm delighted about that because that's exactly the spirit that we need. Um, they decided, both groups decided, well, well, let's crack on with that while other, part, while, while other things are happening. And that needs, again, to, it needs the leadership. It needs to be focused on learning. And SIMD is not about learning. Tavish, and you asked. Right, Tavish. thank you, Ross. Um, the, the discussion around about SIMD um, something that's also been discussed at the Public Audit Committee um, as we looked at Auditor Jed 
Auditor General's um, report. Um, following that, I've had my own discussions with Aberdeen University, Robert Gordon's University, and something that's come through in those discussions is that with the current funding settlement for universities and the cap places for Scottish students, if we're going to be increasing uh, demand um, and um, having more homegrown students going to, to university, there'll be fiercer competition. Um, there was some concern expressed to me that we could that we could displace able students. How do we avoid doing that? Um, shall I kick do off? Do you want to start <laughs> now? It, it, it was one of the, the issues discussed at the Commission, um, no doubt, because it, it came up as a topic. And we decided it wasn't up to us to make recommendations as to whether student numbers are capped or not. So it was up to the Scottish Government to react to our recommendations. Uh, now, whether displacement or not is taking place is arguable, but it is clear if by 2030 we want to have 20% of SMD20 students in universities, it means that there are some students who would have got in, might not have got in. Now the question whether that is fair or not is a different matter, because somebody who would have got in now with the particular grades might show less potential than a student who wouldn't have got in now and who would actually succeed. So it is uh, not right to say that we need another 20% students or, or places for that. So that doesn't quite work. But there is a danger that some students might be squeezed out and it might be those who are um, just about getting into university. So they're the squeezed middle, so to say. So we need, we need to look at that very carefully uh, in, in all of our three work streams in University of Scotland. So we've already addressed it. Uh, the three <coughs> leaders of the work streams we meet regularly to look at that as well. But all we can do is, is work within the environment we are working in and then doing our best. But I want to say, okay. I'm independent now and I was stood down the day after we launched the report, that you have displacement now. You have, you have displacement now. You have displacement of bright young people who don't have the right badges through no fault of their own. Scotland uh, in the Four Nations, of course, has got the highest um, percentage of advantaged young people going to university than the other nations. Thank you, uh, Fulton, and then very briefly the after that. Yeah, Sorry. thanks a lot. Um, it's just a sort of second to the, the conversation we're having just now about the SM idea. Uh, and the area that I represent is an area of high, high deprivation. And I think that for me, I don't know whether you detected um, when you were looking through it, it's still about a, an attitudinal thing. Um, you know, when I, when I went to, I was lucky enough to go to university when I finished school. Uh, and like uh, a few of my friends that I went with, I was sort of the first in my family uh, to have went. But I still feel that, you know, going around schools and going around the area, there's still a, a consensus among a lot of young people that, you know, no, university is not for me. I, I wouldn't be able to go to university. So there's that whole um, societal <laughs> attitude or thing. But I wondered when you were doing, um, when you were doing, the, when you were investigating the circumstances, what exactly you found in SMID areas or other areas that were preventing that. For example, um, welfare, um, the, the situation around welfare uh, reform, how is that impacting? I mean, I, I think you're spot on with that, actually. The attitude uh, is, is, a, is a big problem. Um, and actually, some of the universities, you know, Robert Gordon, I think, has got this fabulous setup where they have pre-freshers. Uh, pre so they do, I mean, you, you really have all of the problems cracked in some place or another in Scotland. But I wanted to say that that attitude is not just about getting in, it's about staying there. And it's also about the kind of jobs people apply for when they leave. So it goes on. It, 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 it can be a lifelong burden, I think, if we're not careful. It's definitely there. The young people who have broken through tackling that have done so with, with support, support for, le for, for learners as well as support for learning. Um, uh, but, but we're very aware. I mean, I, I, I did a couple of the summer schools. I actually went along as a summer school uh, uh, kind of learner sat in and some of the teaching and um, the, pre the people were saying well actually these, these learners they won't they won't come to summer schools because they need to work they don't have money they went to summer schools and they worked hard at weekends and actually they themselves mentored one another on how to have more confidence how to not be put down uh, by the posh ones was how one of the young women described it 
but it is a big problem, um, and it's, I, I think it's, it, it's really palpable here in a way that I'm not sure. I mean, I, I've always worked in areas of deprivation access is my speciality, but I, was, I noted um, you know, instantly really how, how hard it was for them to see themselves in those positions. But there's work going on in, in, in early years, for example, where you walk in and the teddy bear on the desk is sitting there in its gown and mortarboard. So, so, you know, work is going on, you know, reaching back down the system to take some of this stuff on, because it is a big problem, even when you have the qualifications. Yeah, um, just come back to, to what uh, Professor Wayne said, that um, we've not mentioned the role of colleges in this. You know, so we, we do, I mean, this, this, I don't particularly agree with this displacement idea, because there is always a place, and colleges, what would you say the role of colleges is in higher education, because of course colleges do provide higher education and also a route to university for people. The work streams that we are leading on in University of Scotland is on articulation and colleges obviously play a big role in there and I think that universities and colleges in Scotland can improve on that one. What we need to be mindful about is uh, that the, uh, the courses taught in colleges aren't only feeder programmes for universities. And, and this is something that we need to, to find the right framework for. So those who are, are able to go to university should, and that should be encouraged, but we also need closer working relationships between colleges in Scotland to look at the curriculum so that it fits, because we do not want the uh, articulation students to fail once they get into university, because the curriculum is just not matched at all. So this is, again, something we are looking very closely at in, in one of our three work streams. But colleges do play a huge role, but we mustn't forget that colleges also offer skills and offer uh, prepare people for work and aren't just feeder courses for universities. So my own background is further education. I'm in college principal and I am greatly admiring of, um, of the concept of articulation and some of the work I've seen is splendid. Um, there's a, the, I think Scotland's on the cusp of a risk about how it sees articulation. And it feels to me something like this, um, that actually it's, uh, and, and you'll know that, the expansion in Scotland and widening access has been through your college system much more than through your university system. Let's be clear about that. Um, and, articul and, and it's wonderful, and I, and I uh, have to tell you that I brag about it in England. But um, there's something really wrong at the engagement end. So we found young people and older people doing the same level for certainly twice. You know, they moved from a, um, a college into university, but actually crossed over to the same level. There was no progression in it for very good reasons. That's why we have the framework for access. Uh, the, the, the modules didn't fit or there was a specialism that they needed. Articulation on the whole is not portable. What you do with, for one to getting into one university is not nationally portable. It's an agreement, a compact between institutions. Nevertheless, it is a fabulous, fabulous way of working, and it worked for Scotland. Uh, but it's um, uh, on the cusp of risk is it will be seen as second class, it will be seen as not portable, it will cost more money, and people will waste money doing things on the same level. And that should not be going on. That's not, not right. A case like what you're saying about, um, about the, the variation in, in the country, that there are examples of very good practice where you, college and universities have got arrangements that absolutely yeah. gel. Yeah. Yeah. And we teach, you know, we let the, college, the university lecturers work with the, 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 the college lecturers on the same programme with the same students. So you, you can't tell the difference. And other ones, they don't see one another. Thank you. Uh, Fulton, very briefly, and then Tavi. Yeah, d did you find that there was any um, difference at all in two, two sort of groups? So this is a bit broad brush and generalistic, the two groups, but groups of young people who maybe had been intending to go to university or college for a long time, possibly all their life, and if not, if not that long, maybe, um, maybe for a, a, a good few years before that, and other young people who get to the age of 15, 16, 17, and realise that they need to do something because their life before that has been taken up with dealing with maybe parental issues, mental health, uh, you know, alcohol, drug abuse, being young carers, living in dire poverty. So maybe they've not been thinking about it. Did you detect a difference between those two broad groups of people? To comment, of course, because she runs Glasgow's uh, schools. Um, and, and we didn't, uh, in terms of the commission, we didn't look at that at that level of detail. I'm drawing from my own experience in Glasgow. Um, we work incredibly hard um, with our, our partner universities and colleges to pull those experiences further and further down the school um, so that we don't have young people getting to age 
15 and suddenly thinking, gee, I don't really know about college or, or university. And we're, we've got a, 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 oh, an incredibly ra wide range of initiatives that are on the go. And that's one of the issues for me, is that there's, there's too many and there's overlap. And we're battling over the same group of young people. And in order to get best value, we need to streamline. And it's back to Dame Ruth's point about um, institutional-based. So University of Glasgow runs its summer school for young people going to to University of Glasgow, Strathclyde does the same. So why is there not one summer school that gives young people access to any university in Scotland? Um, you know, there's little things like that, but the importance of um, having young people and children right down from early years um, exposed to those range, that broader range of experiences uh, with their parents too. So we work with an example would be Glasgow Caledonian run their Caledonian club um, in learning communities where they work age three to 18 all the way through uh, with a, a wide variety of experiences, but it's about making going to university normal. Actually, it's about learning. It doesn't have to be that university. It's about showing that education makes a difference to people's lives and how important that is. And family learning, you know, that's being pushed just now in a whole range of places is very important, but the families need to get qualifications. It's not just about come and learn how to read together with your child. That has a place, but if we really want to make a systemic difference, we need to encourage our families and the research evidence to show that a young person's potential is, is highly correlated towards mother's qualifications. Um, you know, using that as your kind of baseline, then we need to have families who are qualified. And that means we need to be more flexible about entry. I mean, a lot of the talk is about schools and rightly, because that's the bulk of, of what we're talking about. But we've also got young parents, young parents who for a whole range of reasons have had to move out of education. Do we provide enough pathways to bring them back into education? is the, the way that we fund our college sector and our universities, does it enable fair access for people whose pathways might take them a little bit longer? So, you know, we've taken steps around care experience, but this is tricky territory, you know? This is about individual people and the experiences that they bring. So it's, it's not easy. No, no. It's Yeah, thank you. Uh, you have to forgive me for asking this, but are we obsessed with universities? Are they the be and all, be and end all of life in Scotland? Um, uh, Petra is. <laughs> I find myself in a position where I brag about Scotland and England, but really have to say different things up here. Absolutely, and um, <clears throat> and I'm, I used to sit in. I, I grew up in Lanarkshire and stayed there a bit when I was here, and I used to love going in the train to Glasgow in the morning because you'd hear young people having a, a debate about the currency. Shall I go to this university because I get an extra year and I get work experience, or shall I go here? And I thought, you know, I don't hear those conversations in the tube in London. So it is there, and, 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 and it's, to our, it's to our credit that people value education so highly, and less because it's a, a route to work here. I mean, education, uh, it, it, it will change, but certainly education, in my experience here, is valued as being a good thing in its own right. Um, uh, the evidence is, of course, that more people here go on to university than the other three nations. Um, yes. I will nail my colours oh, to no, the no. mast. Of, of course, <laughs> of course yes, it, it is. Of course it is. But actually, what's offered in Scotland is different from what's offered in England. There's other, other things going on there as well. So um, you have, I mean, I, I can talk a lot about the strength, but one of the strengths in your system is the college system, because higher education, higher level, skills uh, in, in Scotland is, is, is stronger than it is in other parts of the, of, of the country. That's because people in Scotland want to have a job. And it's always been there. To be honest, I wasn't so worried about England. I was more worried about <laughs> being part of a parliamentary committee 15 years ago who wrote reports about parity of esteem between vocational routes into economic life and university education. And you've rather confirmed that we haven't made any progress on that in 15 years, or have we? I wondered if we were chasing, I mean, me too, and I was wondering if I was chasing the right thing. I mean, I've become yeah. much more addicted to the concept of parity of outcome than parity of esteem. Yeah. You know, you can't dictate the esteem, but you can actually measure, monitor, target outcomes. So parity of outcome, I think, is the test of access. Okay. If I, oops, uh, I add to this one, it's for me, 
it's very much uh, from the child's or person's perspective. And they need to have the options available to them. So barriers need to be removed to whatever the right outcome is. So if, if I look at the academies program that Queen Margaret University are running, it's a two-year program jointly taught with schools, colleges, universities, and employers. Now that means that children can decide after one year whether they want to stay in school, whether they want to go to college, whether they want to do two years and go to university. But then they have the options and aspirations, coming back to your questions, are, are there, the, it, it is possible. So it's about removing the options. So it's not, not about saying is, is the university be it and all. It's, it's removing the barriers so that it is possible and that children know about the possibility. And in the same vein, Children's University as well, which, which we are running in Scotland, it is getting children and the parents and carers into the university to see that it might be an option. Not that is where they should be going, but that it, it could be an option for them going into university. Uh, I lead on the bridging programs for Scotland, and if you look at the commission, the report, it talk, takes, talks mainly about summer schools, but I want to widen that, and I want to look at all kinds of bridging programs, but all of them will have in common is that university is an option, and, and that uh, children and parents are well informed to see what might be possible for them. Uh, and it's children's university might be part of that, going right back to, to a young age, five-year-old to 14-year-olds. It's raising aspirations. And perhaps as an additional point as well, raising aspirations, this is what I wanted to respond to your original question. The four universities in Edinburgh, for example, have already got together to look at a raising aspirations program together so that we don't overburden schools to get uh, programs from all sides come up to us and we help you to get into university. So we want to have a, a coherent program so that schools can make a, an easier choice. I was quite interested actually in a comment that uh, Professor Wendt made, um, and I'd like to just confirm that. Um, he said that two out of three young people lived in areas uh, that we would not consider to be deprived. Two out of three, that seems a high proportion. Two out of three are deprived, but do not live in a deprived area. Okay, so two out of three are deprived, but do not live in a deprived area. Where did that figure come from? It's, it's I, I don't know, it's research we have done uh, as part of University of Scotland's research, uh, working out the basket of measures for, for deprivation. I haven't seen that figure before, so obviously I'm quite interested in it. Yes, Do I'll, I'll take it out for you and send it to you. Perfect. Do you know which, uh, what proportion of that yeah. is rural? No. I, I'm sure we do, but I don't have it here. But I can send you, as, as a chair, the information, yes. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> obviously, targeting is, is, is quite important here. And there's been a suggestion that, obviously, the SM, SIMD data isn't as accurate as it should be, and that's been discussed around the table today. There's also a suggestion that we should complement that data with information from other sources. Uh, for ex an example has been given of parental occupation, which seems to be a very dodgy one to use. It, it smacks a bit of elitism there. I mean, my constituency, there's not many stockbrokers, but there's lots of very well-off plumbers, joiners and, uh, and electricians. How would you do that? Look at that in our admissions group. Uh, we, we are still very uncertain about all of that. We need to come up with a framework that we all understand, but most importantly, that uh, the potential students and the teachers and the parents and carers understand as well, because that is part of the problem. We already work in, in contextualized admissions, but even we universities do not quite understand what the other university is doing. So if we don't understand it, how can the potential future students understand <coughs> that? So this is our aim. And that's the recommendation about it being, the, the contextual admissions being published and known to parents and, and schools, so that that, 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 is, uh, that doesn't happen. I mean, I mean, I can see you picking up, for example, um, parents that are unemployed, but there's a huge chunk of working poor out there, people that are just making ends meet and bumping along at the very bottom. How do you pick them up? It's not going to be an easy task. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. Is it possible? 
I think it is, but I think it's a mistake to look for one factor that will identify. Yeah. That's, we need a system of factors that gives you the texture of the young person yeah. or the older person applying to university. But it's, each it's factor a combination. has to be robust. Sorry? Each factor has to be robust, otherwise you won't get the desired result. OK, but uh, no, no, absolutely. And uh, uh, this is a, a phase of exploration of this. But in the end, it is about the compound disadvantage. And you can't, you can't be completely mechanistic because every person is different. You cannot say, tick, plumber, tick this. That, that, that's impossible. So we need to look at, at interviews, getting to know the person. It's going to be very time consuming, but we need to look at a more individualised approach. But if we're looking at something that can be put in place across the country, an individualised approach becomes quite difficult. Can I ask you that? Can I come in? Um, this, I, I suppose what you're talking about is as if the, the person just fills in the application form and that's the first time that the universities get to see them. Um, what we're talking about is a range of programmes with the universities, such as um, uh, Queen Margaret, do with their schools. So actually the universities are getting to know the young people and getting <coughs> to know them from a younger and younger age. And mm. the young people are getting to know the universities. So that contextualisation is beginning to be from points of knowledge, so improving the young person and their family's knowledge, but also improving the university's knowledge of that young person in order to be able to have that contextualisation to be more robust. But it will never be a, if you're in that category, that gets you in, and if you're not in that category, you can't get in. Um, what we need to do is to get that as I come back to that difference between that tension between the systemic approach, which is needed in order to get better value from what we are delivering, and also that individual, and that requires people in schools who have better connections with universities and who know them better, and equally for universities. In Glasgow, we phone up admissions officers around individual cases and engage in conversations about those individual cases, <coughs> sometimes that results in the young person getting in, sometimes it doesn't. But on each side, we've learnt more about, so next time we know more about how we are going to contextualise and get the right qualifications and the right experiences for that young person to enable them to succeed. One of the phrases we used in the Commission a lot was, in, was the notion of building ladders down. Into, into, you know, down into the communities and schools and so on. And we saw an example at Glasgow University whereby students who'd been contacted earlier through the schools and, and, and participating in uh, pre-university programmes um, were on a, a, an MIS system that identified them uh, and in a way that when they came into the university, they, they could then be targeted for particular deficits in their background. Um, actually, and, and, and it looked like it was ordinary, so they would send flyers to young people from school where there had been a problem with math teaching, for example, uh, to offer extra math stuff. But it looked to the students themselves as if everybody was getting this leaflet. So that very, uh, the very delicate, delicate and, and sensitive way of handling them before they come in and when they come in, you know, as I said already, access is not just about getting in, it's about get, staying in and moving on from that. It's access, success and then progress. You have to have success in the middle. And that means people working together. Another suggestion that's been made in terms of complementing SIMD data is level of education, but surely that's already picked up through contextualised admissions. How would that feed in when it's already there itself? Can you rephrase your question? Because we, yeah. it's not part of the there's basket a, of measures. There's a suggestion that, for example, SM, SIMD data should be complemented by a number of other sources. For example, parents' occupation was thrown out as one thing. Level of education was thrown out as another. But when I just look at level of education, I look at contextualised admissions and think, well, isn't that already being taken into account by the universities? We were just wondering if that's the parents' level of education, not the individuals. Well, it... Uh, the, the, the youngsters' level of education, because obviously somebody coming from a school in a deprived background who might be achieving less than someone from a better background could be deemed to have done better simply oh, yes. yeah. because no, of the background it came from. Universities by. are already taken, uh, taking all this into account, but we don't do it in a systemic way across Scotland, and it's not very clear what university does what how. Uh, at Queen Margaret University, yes, we have UCAS entry points, but we do admit students who do not fulfil these points because we are looking at the overall person. So 
every university is already engaged in that, but it is not very clear and obvious to to the children, to the parents, teachers, and so on, how, how we are all doing this. And we need to become clearer with that, and it needs to be a clearer framework across Scotland. How, one last question. How would colleges fit into that? I mean, how, how do colleges fit into, the, into, into this, uh, you know, this articulation and so on, but how would colleges fit in with the SIND, the, the identifying of uh, youngsters and so on? Well, you know, actually, you have the advantage in Scotland of having regionalised your colleges in governance terms. So you have regional boards now that now uh, know what's going on in the area where they lead to. Uh, and I think that that's an enormous help. They are key, uh, key in, in the whole um, ladder of access because they are focused on place. I think I mentioned that as being one of the key components. Um, and, uh, uh, and therefore, they can, they're focused on place. That's on learners as well as opportunities for work and for study. Um, my favourite phrase about colleges is we are the mezzanine floor, actually, in the education system. And uh, we um, are not protected by the law because we're not compulsory and we're not protected by the Queen because we don't have royal charter status. So the changes that go on in colleges are absolutely in the moment. OK, thank you very much. Before I go on to Joanne, can I just remind people two things? One is supplementaries are supplementaries to the question asked. So if you want in for a supplementary, make sure it's relevant to the question just being asked eh, or the answer just given. Eh, and the second thing is uh, we've still got a fair bit to go through, so could we make our questions and our answers as, as short as we possibly can? Because we have got another panel after this. Go on. I'll not take it personally that yeah, you, you said I'm that just before I Pure coincidence, in. I can assure you. Um, I I'm interested in what you say about colleges and what the evidence is about the benefits of regionalisation, to be honest, because I haven't seen it on the ground. But I mean, that's, I suppose, the question I would ask you on further education on the basis of what you've already said is if, there's a, if it's not about parity of esteem, it's parity of outcome. Do you have a view on the issue of parity of resources? Because we've seen the college sector cut. We've seen disproportionate cuts to part-time places so that young parents with caring responsibilities would not be able to do college courses. I don't know if, you're, if, if you looked at that in your, in your, in your work. Only did I look at it. I lived my life in, in similar circumstances. Uh, I, do, I do have views. That's what happens when you're not protected by the law and not protected by the Queen. You are the place where, actually, on the whole, politicians turn to first to bring about change and to, uh, you know, actually, it's not a protected budget. And uh, in not, uh, not having that, you are making great big holes in the stepped approach to widening access. Um, uh, let me just say a bit about regionalisation. I and mean, I think I first met you when I did the curriculum review for the Glasgow Colleges, where we looked at every course in every college and, and looked at uh, my favourite phrase, curriculum intention and found uh, overlap and so on. And uh, that's the gain. It's not in, the gain's not just in governance. It's in working together to make sure resources are being um, employed and deployed usefully, not by doing the same courses as one another, but making sure there's progression within the institution. It's early days. You know, regionalisation's a revolution. With respect, my observation is within the community where I taught, uh -huh. the outreach work done by colleges yeah. no longer happens. Yeah. And there is an issue for young people in some areas that they won't travel, and actually having a, a quali Co quality institution near them yeah. encourages them in and draws them in. And I have a grave reservations now about the capacity of the college sector to do that second chance learning when we in the school system failed them. And I, th and I, I do think there's a, a big question around that. Perhaps that's a No, I completely share inquiry. your concern. It's, it's really, it's a, a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. But that's policy-led and funding-led. It's not, not my not, policy, not, the not my government, but no, I no, no. think uh, in but, terms of a question of if we're looking at access and fairness, you sure, have to look at the sure. way in which the college sector has yeah, suffered. Absolutely. If in your report you're yeah. saying the colleges absolutely. are important. Yeah. But also it would be interesting what you looked at in terms of our schools, because I wonder if you looked at the, the disproportionate disadvantage even within disadvantage. So boys are less likely to do yeah. well than girls. So it's not just about income. There are, and I wonder if you looked at that. Is there an issue around ethnicity and opportunity as well? And <coughs> did you look at <coughs> dropout rates at school level? I, mean, I think there are so many young people who don't even get to compete. They don't even get the opportunity to be denied a place at university because they're no longer in school. 
Absolutely. Uh, uh, again, we didn't have much time to look at that, but we know it to be uh, uh, a, a really big issue. We looked at solutions to that, so we looked at some of the programmes in the Glasgow, uh, the Glasgow uh, schools and what was being done um, uh, to compensate for that. Um, you know, if you remove the middle, it's, it's the squeeze middle, not just in terms of individuals, but also in terms of institutions. If you lose the college sector, and the college sector, I think very cleverly, have been able to find ways of still working with young people, but that's to the credit of their creativity and good links with the education authorities and with employers. But there it's are, not systematic. Uh, there are cuts to school budgets. Hmm? Those cuts very often come to the bits yeah. of the system that support people to stay in school. You know, there are programmes like that. Yeah. And, all over the place. Yeah. Does that, that in itself is in effectively a barrier to a young person learning? It is, and it's a growing barrier. So what is your, what, in your terms of your recommendations, have you addressed this question of the importance of the soft supports around young people oh, yes. to draw I them mean, into school? Sure, sure. I mean, we talk a lot about the importance of learning support, but the, the heart of the matter that you raise, of course, is a matter not for the Commission to discuss. It's government's policies on funding and resources. And we took the decision not to talk about that. Is there not a contradiction being asked by government to address the question of fair access and not commenting on some of the issues that may actually be um, creating the concerns? Or, uh, we certainly commented, we didn't make recommendations access. on it. Well, we made recommendations that we, we talk about a holistic approach. We cannot just talk about admissions without mm -hmm. talking about schools and colleges. And this is why our recommendation came to have a commissioner uh, for fair access who might have the oversight to, to make recommendations to Scottish government on schools, colleges and universities. Because we, we had not only schools and employers and colleges represented, but also early years. And we could see it was a question from the cradle to the grave. So this is why we made these concrete recommendations that it has to be a holistic approach. But for practical recommendations, this was Commission on Widening Access to Universities. The practical recommendations had to concern universities, and that was our remit. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ross Greer. Um, Dame Silver mentioned compound uh, disadvantage. I was wondering if you could lay out a little bit what uh, findings came from the report in relation to young people with additional support needs, because young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are proportionately far more likely to have additional support needs, which if, going, if they go unsupported, act as a multiplier to the existing uh, disadvantage. Heard plenty of uh, anecdotal evidence of young people with ASN not being directed towards even making an application in the first place. So I was just wondering if you could lay out what you found in relation to ASN. Um, I mean, it, it is exactly as you describe. Uh, one of the, the successes we found, if I can just talk about that because we were an appreciative inquiry, was actually it's when the, the receiving end of the progression is the one doing the learning support. So to be supported by you know, this, this idea of a pre-fresher summer, actually that just made things become more real. It boosted motivation. And actually there were young people themselves and also mentors from the university, people who had graduated, working with them. They saw the next stage of what they could become. And, um, and there's no way that you can do access without learning support. There's such a lot of catch-up. Um, it's compensatory education, really, in its truest sense. But it's got to be in the hands of the right people. Uh, and I've, I, I think what I saw in Scotland was compensatory education in terms of learning support all the way. Not done institutionally alone, you know, volunteers in the community, all sorts of employer projects, um, school staff and university staff working differently. It is crucial. Don't widen participation to further failure. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have Daniel. So in the interest of time, I'll just ask one question. So if you'll just go, allow me just to explain. I, I will do that if it's going to be so, one I mean, question. We've already talked a lot about um, articulation. I think it's very important. Um, but in my discussions with, especially at Strathclyde University, people running the engineering academy, what they told me was that there's an awful lot of wraparound work that has gone in both before students join them and actually once they've done that. Now, bearing in mind what you've said about making sure that college uh, qualifications and indeed kind of other routes to university aren't just routes to university, the w work to make articulation work has to be a lot more than just uh, you know, routes to that there's actually that support that's required, you know, both with students before and after they, 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 they articulate. I was just wondering if, if you'd agree with that sentiment and what investment 
and support do you think needs to be put in place to really make articulation work properly, both from colleges, but actually I think there's also another point around uh, you know, other routes potentially from apprenticeships and the wider skill sector as well. Well, the of course, its origins are in vocational, technical, scientific training. So, uh, and, uh, and lots of the students we spoke to had no wish to go any further than just, you know, than uh, getting the college part of the qualifications. Others did. Others came back later. This notion of portability is not just about location, it's also about time. So run it, running a curriculum like that is really complicated. Uh, um, so uh, let me say I like the wide base of that. I like the vocational focus. Um, th there's a famous Scottish report of years ago who talked about the importance of vocational focus in widening access uh, the Brunswick report, it, it's, it's way, way back in, in, in time. We looked at that. We looked at why articulation was great in some places and not so good in others. Uh, and actually, we saw one attempt, I think, at articulation in, in an arts subject area, which didn't work quite so well. Um, I, think it's, it, I think it's the same as some of the access work. It's grown and grown and grown. Uh, but actually, it has not had the chance to be reflected upon and refined. And there, are, and there are different streams within, whether people are going to go on to do higher education, late, higher qualifications later. So that, it, it's a, there's, a, there's a lovely, the mezzanine floor, it's a lovely pausing point to, to, to revisit the, the intention of the learners. Some of them did change their mind and tried work. We met some young people who had started um, a, 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 a two by two course um, in, a, in a college who went on to university and who did not like university and went back to the college. And the college had found a way of working with the university and the open university to actually let that student qualify. So modular credit-based um, qualifications are, are just a, a great answer. Complicated to get to, though. I mentioned underused um, assets in Scotland. I think the Open University, and I remember saying, you should be ashamed you're so modest. You're doing fabulous things for young people. Um, and the qualifi credit qualification framework, I've seen some degrees being done in Glasgow uh, with, with, the, with, that, with that qualification system. So there's, you know, that's what I meant when I said it's all there in Scotland. It just has to be harvested, pruned, and, and then farmed, I think, a, 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 in a wide way. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Ross, do you have another question to ask? One question Reflection. as well. Um, thank you, um, convener. Sorry, um, uh, you know, this committee has done a lot of work looking at you know, SQA, Education Scotland, um, and as part of that, it's looked at the interaction between ministers and the agencies. Um, Joanne has previously asked questions around about when policy maybe hasn't been achieving the right outcome. Um, has there been that challenge? Liz Smith today asked questions about the data and ensuring the data is there for decisions, particularly when we get to a 20% figure, how we got to that and how we'll achieve that. Discussion about SIMD, uh, and I quote, not being maybe the right measure um, and you know maybe needing something more sophisticated. So my question to um, Dame Silver is, as the Commissioner, are you able to challenge government and will you challenge government? Oh, the commissioner. Sorry, apologies. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> to, 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 no, no. I was stood down, um, and the commissioner's <laughs> sorry, here, and right behind me, waiting to come on. Um, uh, the, I, this thing about the leadership of the system. The system involves government as well. You know, this, the government's not out, outside the system. It's a very important role in that. Um, so, um, if I were the commissioner, absolutely yes. But you can ask him in a minute, can't you? I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In, in that case. Do we have anybody else who wants to ask a final question very briefly? This is on, on contextualised. Yes, right. yep. um, I'm very interested in this issue about contextualised uh, entry and also on the access thresholds, which I think um, you've already indicated are pretty complex and it's a very difficult decision. You said a little while ago that you felt that the, there was lots of evidence that Scotland's already doing most of the good things, but it's not joined up and it's not universal across the system. Do you believe that decisions about contextualised entry, and particularly when it comes to the access thresholds, which are obviously a specialised part of that, do you believe that that is a matter for individual departments in, within universities to take, or do you think there has to be intervention from government? Um, do you want 
you add to that one? No. Well, I, I think that the universities, we are trying to lead on that to make the right recommendations. So we are going to be in, in contact with uh, Sir Peter regularly on that one, just to make sure that we don't only work in parallel, but that we are working constructively together as well. But University of Scotland, as I said before, we already started to work stream on that one. I'm, I'm sure that we do won't come up with one access threshold for each particular subject or one, so, so it, it needs to be slightly more sophisticated because universities are different, but we will come up with a framework that will be easily understood and that will be far more accessible. I, I just make the point in the context that um, you're all supporters of the autonomy of the system and I know that the commissioner himself has a long record of being supportive of that autonomy and therefore when it, when it comes to the decisions which it appears in some universities working extremely well that that decision should rest with the individual institution and indeed the departments because obviously there's different demand and supply and therefore there will be different conditions on what, what that and, and is that something that you work at? Universities are autonomous and this is what we are continuing to defend but we also made clear as, as lead uh, persons on these three work streams that we don't just want to come up with a narrative that pleases uh, the commissioner or Scottish government or others, but something that universities really want to embrace and do. So that is something we, we, we very fiercely believe in and have already agreed as, as the three uh, chairs of the bridge, uh, of the programs. I, I think I just want to point out that the report does actually uh, uh, Say, trust the professionals in the first phase, this first five years. Let them deliver. Let them see, you know, my, my claim that Scotland knows how to do this. Let's see what they come up with and see what that is in five years' time. Because, I, because my, my, my clear view was that actually this is doable. It will need looking at, of course, and be ready for the next five years. But actually give people the space to do that. They are the professionals. Two courses need different entry requirements dependent on subjects and, and levels. So uh, we need that uh, professional intricacy, I think, to be there, but also to be um, observable, published and scrutinised. Okay, thank you. Tavish, did you have a supplementary? To well, can I just a different issue, if I can? Just well, uh, I'll let Gillian in first, then, Gillian. You wanted to talk about carers. Um, well, I was, I was going to ask a question about, you mentioned um, recommendations around uh, people for who were care experienced, but young carers as well have issues about, um, and I, I wonder, did you have any dialogue with uh, young carers and their families? We had dialogue with young carers as well. And again, uh, looking at the three work streams of University of Scotland, we are looking at all the aspects. We do not want to limit ourselves to uh, the groups described in, in, in the Commission's report. We also want to look at part-timers. We want to look at adult learners. We want to look at carers. So that is all part of our work. No, I'm, 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 I'm. Tavish. Thank you. Can I just ask about recommendation 17 about Skills Development Scotland and schools working together? Because you go on to say there that uh, those that SDS and schools should basically assist learners at key transition phases throughout their education. Um, and I guess my question uh, is that in order to make that recommendation, you must have had some concerns about what was currently happening between SDS and schools. Would you be would it be possible just to elaborate on what your concerns were there? Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to take that question. Um, we took some of the evidence also from some of the work that had gone on from developing a Scotland's Young Workforce, um, where the recommendations there, as you know, were about um, careers advice and guidance and SDS working um, uh, further down the school. And um, that was part of the evidence that we received to endorsing that, but also ensuring that um, the advice then stretched into the college and the university, that it didn't just remain within the school. And um, part of the, the discussion well, we just had there about the different entries, you need the data on the skills shortages on the employment areas. That needs to feed into the university system um, through SDS and the various organisations in order to be able to ensure that we've got those pipelines coming through. And that may mean that you need to alter thresholds for entry at various times. But in, in reference to 
um, this was it was really about saying uh, that SDS and their careers advice and guidance had to go much further down the school, recognising that particularly from the, the learners from disadvantaged backgrounds needed those interventions at a much, much earlier stage. And, and we, you know, we didn't speak about SIMD. Um, it was about learners from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I, I think that, um, I mean, I, I'll throw in my little bit. You know, SIMD is a reasonable metric. You know, I don't think we should discount it. It is a basket of indicators, but no statistic is perfect. And, it, you know, if you're out there looking for a measure then uh, that's just going to give the answer to everything, then that's a lost cause. That wasn't yeah. for me the issue here. It was, it was actually Skills Development Scotland and that organisation being flexible enough in terms of how I read your recommendation. Do you think it is? My, my view from a Glasgow perspective, no. I think they, they try their best, um, but no. Uh, I'm, I'm, no, so I have. I have you'd, be, you'd be suggesting we kept an eye on that one. because I certainly area. do, thank yes. You. That's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very thank helpful. you very much. Fulton, would you want to come back in? Oh, no, no. Okay. Well, in that case, and this time, we, we have finished with the evidence. I, I'd like to thank the witnesses for their time and for their information today. It was very useful for us all. It was nice to meet you and uh, close this session and I'll give the panel a couple of minutes while we change over. Thank you.
much. The, the third item of business is an evidence session with the newly appointed Commissioner for Fair Access. Can I welcome Peter Scott to the committee and congratulate him on his appointment. Uh, I understand Professor Scott wishes to make an opening statement. I would like to make a very brief uh, opening statement. Uh, I have made the written statement, um, which I hope is useful. Um, what I would like to say um, in terms of an opening statement um, is that it is a great honour to be appointed to this position. Um, I am keenly aware of the kind of burden of expectations that are pressing on my shoulders. Um, uh, it is a great opportunity. Um, and uh, as Ruth Silver said, I think there are many great examples of uh, good practice in the area of fair access across Scotland. Um, uh, in my written statement, I have uh, tried to do three things, really, to be open and frank about my, my starting point, my, my beliefs. Um, uh, but I hope I haven't done that in any kind of dogmatic way. Uh, and I can assure you that uh, I'm certainly not prejudging um, uh, any issue. Um, secondly, I've tried to uh, uh, foresee what might be some of the key debates, and it became apparent from your questions that these do, are some of the key debates. Um, in my opening statement, uh, I emphasise that although these, of course, have a very strong and particular Scottish resonance, they are more general issues. I mean, uh, I think they're very familiar across the United Kingdom, across Europe, and in fact, across the world. Um, and thirdly, uh, I have um, briefly touched on uh, uh, a number of more specific, more detailed topics, which again came out in the questions, um, uh, offering a very preliminary view of those issues. Um, uh, I want to underline that I emphasise there are many other issues uh, which I don't cover in my opening statement, which may be equally important, um, particularly in relation to student support and funding. Uh, I want to allow the maximum time for you to ask me questions, um, uh, which I will do my very best to answer, of course, um, and one I think I've already had pre-notification of. Um, uh, so I'd like to really just make two other uh, preliminary uh, remarks. Um, one is to say that, in a sense, the founding text to refer British higher education was the Robbins Report, uh, published more than half a century ago now. Um, it established a famous principle um, which said that higher education should be available to all those with the potential to benefit and the willingness to do so. Um, and that has been widely accepted, I think, for the last half century as a fundamental principle. So in one sense, fair access, um, we are pushing an open door. Um, I uh, uh, don't think I've ever come across anyone who doesn't believe that access should be fairer. Um, than it is currently. Um, there are, of course, great difficulties about defining how we might achieve that. Um, but also in the Robbins Principle, there are one or two key words. The first one, of course, is all. It doesn't say people who have particular social advantages, people who have parents or graduates. It says all, and that's crucial. A second word is potential. Um, that the emphasis should be on potential, and I think that leads on to discussions of contextualised admissions and so on. Um, in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland, unlike most other European countries, um, higher education institutions effectively choose their students. They decide which have the greatest potential and choose on that basis. Um, there's no automatic entitlement as there would be in France if you passed your baccalaureate or in Germany, if you pass your abitur, or is it as there would be in some American states, uh, where if you graduated sufficiently high in your high school class, you would be automatically entitled to a place in higher education. So universities, in a sense, have always been in the business of measuring potential, um, although that's difficult. Uh, and the second preliminary remark I'd like to make, in a sense, is a very personal one. Um, uh, I recently acquired a new grandchild, um, uh, who's uh, still less than two, um, I can be 90%, 95% confident um, that she will go to university and she will probably go to a good university. Both her parents are graduates. Both her grandparents on, on my side are also graduates, although like baby boomers, we are first generation graduates. Um, 
And my concern is that other babies born in that same hospital that same night, I know that they will not be so certain that they can achieve those ambitions. Um, and I think we all have a responsibility to ensure that we at least strive to create greater fairness in the system. And at that point, I'd like to stop and answer your questions if I can. Thank you very much, and let me congratulate you on your new grandchild. That's uh, always one of life's blessings. The, 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 the final comments you made there play into my question about targeting. The, you, you said in, in your letter, your submission, that you saw SIMD as a sophisticated measure, metric. There seemed to be, a, uh, and I know there was a difference of opinion uh, both around here and, and maybe even from the witnesses about just how effective it is. How a, uh, and I'm sure you're not saying that's the only method, there are other methods that have to go along with that, but do you, could you explain to me what you see those other methods being and how you would capture them? It's, it's a relatively comprehensive measure. I mean, it takes into account multiple aspects of deprivation um, as opposed to single measures. Um, uh, I think there are strong links, as has already been said this morning, uh, between areas of deprivation and lower performing schools, uh, a much more limited range of people who have graduate qualifications living in those areas. Uh, so there's a range of things which come together to, I think, um, intensify disadvantage. Um, uh, but as I say in my opening uh, written statement, um, I'm very aware that any kind of area-based metric, uh, there are issues. They produce, I suppose, what might be called false positives or false negatives, um, and we should be sensitive to that. Um, so the work that University of Scotland is undertaking looking at these areas, and frankly, the scepticism that University of Scotland has about how appropriate this is as a measure uh, to determine targets, um, I think that's uh, to be welcomed. I think any work that can be done to develop more sophisticated basket of measures uh, should be encouraged. But I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not a bad starting point, I think is what I'm saying. No, I think that's, that, I think that's a fair thing to, to say. I, I'm going to move on to Liz, would like to come in on this, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, Professor Scott, I think one of the most interesting things to us, and we heard it from the panel previously, that obviously there are certain things that universities are doing extremely well just now. And there are obviously certain things where there are weaknesses and things that still need to be done. In the short time that you've been in the job, would you be able to flag up to this committee where you think uh, there are already strengths that need to be built upon and developed across the institutions? And particularly, could you flag up where you think there are particular weaknesses uh, that we really need to address? Would you be able to do that? Um, well, I'll try. Um, I hope I won't be unfair in any comments I make. Um, uh, I think the strengths um, are very much in terms of bridging programmes, summer schools, um, uh, links with colleges in relation to special programmes. Um, the major weakness is much too strong a word, um, but I think articulation um, uh, could be very much improved, um, uh, as I outline in my written statement. I think that's my broad conclusion at this point, yes. Um, and if I could just add to that, um, and I think Ruth Silver made this point herself, of course a lot of this practice is very customised. It, it's for a particular college and a particular institution working together, often, often in a particular subject area, so they're very, very targeted. Um, and I think the challenge is to generalise some of that experience um, uh, make it more compatible um, so that uh, students are not locked into necessarily a limited range of choices, that they can have a wider range of choices. Um, uh, equally, I would not be in favour, I think, um, of trying to produce an over-centralised and over-determined system. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, this problem about data that we referred to in the in the previous uh, session, um, I come back to the point that I think the data set is extremely important, both quantitatively and qualitatively, in leading us not only to be able to identify where the problems lie, but obviously to uh, give direction both to yourself and then obviously to the Scottish Government. Do you agree that, generally speaking, there is quite good data out there, but it's not... Um, put across in a systemic man manner or 
Is there a lack of data? What would you like to see to be able to help uh, inform you and uh, allow you to do your job as well as possible? Well, certainly there is a lot of data available. Um, I think it's often not presented always in a terribly helpful form. Um, if I can just give one example, I mean, data is often uh, divided into younger initial entrants and older initial entrants, more mature initial entrants. Um, I think in the reality we now face in universities and colleges, that's not always a helpful distinction, yet it's quite difficult to get data that is not compartmentalized in that kind of way. Um, in terms of uh, data at a more qualitative data, at a more individual, institutional, or, or, or program or subject basis, um, I think there's masses out there. Um, it's often, again, very customized. Um, uh, I think one of the comments made in the Commission's report was that they were concerned about a lack of evaluation of things that worked well and things that worked less well. Um, and I think it's certainly true that people who are very enthusiastic about fair access and have put a lot of personal effort and commitment into developing a program, uh, frankly, they don't want to be told that it didn't work very well. So there's a bias to actually say this has been quite successful. So maybe we need to find ways in which we can be a little bit more rigorous in terms of evaluation without in any way dampening the enthusiasm or discouraging people from uh, experimenting with new ways. My, my last question, uh, convener. I, I think I think you're absolutely right on that, and it, you know, what you said earlier about the fact that nobody has a divine right to go to uh, university. That's absolutely correct, and I think that's a great strength of the system that it is left uh, to the decisions among the institutions as to uh, who has the right potential. The the issue, however, comes back to this data that if if we do go down the road of um, more consistent contextualised entry and obviously looking at some flexibility when it comes to the access thresholds, that the institutions, the knowledge that the institutions have and their departments specifically is absolutely critical to making the right decision about to whom they offer a place. That's absolutely essential. Do we need to do more to allow these institutions who are autonomous, and I know you're a great supporter of that autonomy, to have a better understanding of where that data could come from? Um, yes, I think that, that has to be true. Um, uh, and I think it's absolutely right that, as Ruth Silver said, we, we should trust the professionals. I mean, um, I think we should always trust people who are actually working uh, in these areas themselves. Um, uh, I think the approach to contextualised admissions, the best approach, should be, of course, to leave the detailed work with institutions. And I would say not just with institutions, but with subjects. I think the key thing is to actually determine, I mean, people who understand contextualised admissions in relation to fine art will be very different from the people who understand contextualised admissions in context of electrical engineering. Um, uh, so it's subject expertise as much as the institutional perspective that I think is important. Um, uh, but I think there is value, and I hope that University of Scotland and their work will carry this forward, in trying to develop in some broad guidelines of the kind of um, uh, factors that might go into the mix in con contextualised admissions. And, perhaps approximately the kind of weight that should be attached to them, some sort of broad guideline, some broad guide, not, not a rigid prescription by any means. So I think one should, of course, rely on the expertise of the people who are directly involved, particularly subject basis, of what's appropriate um, in terms of factors that might be taken into account. Um, but I do think one wants to struggle to generalise this a bit, to make it transparent, um, uh, so that that experience can be shared in across institutions, um, and also, crucially, of course, that it becomes more plain, I think, to potential applicants, um, what, how they will be judged. Tavish? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, Professor Scott, thank you for the breadth of your submission, um, and, and therefore the weight of the tasks that you've obviously uh, planned to undertake. In, in that context, how many days a month are you contracted to provide for in, in this role? Um, I'm contracted to provide uh, three to five days a month. Um, I think uh, I'm realistic. I think that probably it will take more than that. Um, 
So my assumption should be that I should spend at least five days a month physically present in Scotland. Um, uh, and um, I suspect that I might spend as much time again uh, in reality thinking and reading and communicating in other ways with people. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think this was uh, determined for funding reasons to put a cap on um, the commitment, and I absolutely agree with that. I mean, uh, and has the government given you um, a budget and and a range and some staff as well to support um, the role? I've been uh, inherited uh, excellent staff who supported the work of the commission, um, and in the short run, they will be working with me. Um, uh, I am afraid I don't have a budget, so I noticed that uh, there are references in the uh, commission's report to uh, commissioning research, um, and uh, at the moment, I have no resources to do that. But I would certainly um, uh, argue in specific instances, if there does seem to be a need for research, uh, I would go back to the, the government and uh, suggest that they might provide some resources. Equally, I think um, one uh, needs to work with uh, other research organisations to try and shape their research agendas. Um, and do you think the research, I mean, the research that Liz Smith's just been asking about, and you mentioned in your submission about SIMD, is that something uh, that you consider to be important enough to ask the government to provide some resource to do that? Well, I think, I, I think in the first place I need to um, uh, uh, do a lot of work to understand these issues better. Um, uh, I think it would be premature for me on perhaps a half understanding of some of these issues uh, to make demands. Um, uh, but I would certainly think, that, as I said earlier, that the, the search for kind of the most sensitive possible metrics, um, uh, that should be encouraged as much as possible. And I see myself as playing some role in that. Thank you. And the other question I was going to ask is, uh, the Commission obviously made, um, I forget now exactly how many recommendations, but many recommendations. Is your job description such that you are tasked with implementing those recommendations? Well, I I've obviously, get, first of all, I should emphasize that, of course, some of those recommendations are directed to me, but some are directed to the government and some are directed to the, uh, the funding council. Um, so I, uh, I, I don't, uh, I suspect some of my responsibility might be to manage down expectations of what the commissioner individually can deliver. Um, equally, I accept um, that the commissioner has a key role and that is the challenge for me. Um, um, uh, how I might work, I've given a great deal of thought to that. Um, at this stage, clearly, I am uh, um, in the mode of listening to people, um, uh, meeting all the relative stakeholders, um, and also meeting, visiting institutions to find out on the ground what people are doing. Um, uh, at some point, I need to move into a more proactive mode, if I can put it like that. Um, uh, for government and for the funding council, do you see your role as overseeing those and therefore I think, keeping I think those it's organizations? Certainly my responsibility to uh, uh, comment on that, if I think that's appropriate. Sure. Um, uh, uh, one of the, the few formal responsibilities I'm given is to produce an annual report, um, and I can assure you, perhaps preempting another question, um, that I would do so uh, without fear or favour. Um, uh, equally, I hope it will be grounded in evidence, and I hope it will be well informed, I hope it will be sensitive. Um, uh, and I think um, trying to establish precisely the degree to which I should become too deeply involved in things, and at what point I should stand back, so in a sense I can make judgments, I think that could be quite difficult in certain situations. Um, uh, and I'm the first commissioner, mm. um, not only am I new, but the role is new. Mm. Um, so I think, uh, to some degree, it's experimental. Okay. I think perhaps in a year or you will have a better idea, and I will have a much better idea of whether it's worth. One thing I can promise you, I, I have no intention of trying to operate via a Twitter account. <laughs> it's, very, it's very popular these days. I know I it is. I it. Uh, 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 well, at least you're not a czar. You should be grateful that they haven't called you a czar, I suspect, no, no. either. <laughs> Never mind anything else. One last question, if I may, Convener. Um, the, uh, if the, the week that you plan to spend, as it were, physically in Scotland proves, proves to be insufficient, will I take, on, take it on the principle of no fear or favour? You'll certainly say to the government, look, I need more time to do this job adequately, given the challenges that exist. Um, I certainly won't demand extra resources in terms of personally, um, but uh, I would certainly be prepared to take on more um, uh, time. Uh, 
equally, uh, I need to be realistic. I have other responsibilities, uh, uh, other fixed points in my diary which I have to keep to. Um, uh, but certainly, I've accepted this is a major commitment. And I think in my mind, I'm thinking of it as a kind of half-time commitment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Ross, Ross Greer. Thanks, Roach. Convener, this might sound like quite a broad uh, question to start off with, but I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the definition of fair access that you'll be working with, because I know it's a, a concern the NUS have raised going forward. Um, that is a very broad question. Um, uh, and I think one of the issues is that there are many dimensions of fairness, and to some extent they come into conflict with each other. Um, uh, it is clearly unfair that people are categorically disadvantaged because of their social situation from having a hope of participating in higher education. Um, uh, equally, it's unfair if, as a result of encouraging them to participate more, other people are excluded. Um, uh, so there are many, many dimensions of fairness. Uh, and I think one of the ways I can contribute is by encouraging a very open and very frank debate about precisely what fairness means. Um, uh, um, uh, because as I say, um, if it was simple, um, uh, I think we would have found a solution a long time ago. Um, I think we have to work at this in many dimensions. Um, One of the, the concerns that uh, Ben US had raised was around the balance between getting more young people from disadvantaged backgrounds into university and the issue that's, that's already been raised uh, in this committee session of parity of esteem between further higher and vocational education, breaking down the privilege and the idea that uh, further and vocational education are somehow lesser than. How do you see the balance in your work between getting more yeah, disadvantaged young people into university and creating parity of esteem between the levels of education? Well, I prefer, I think, to emphasize higher education uh, rather than universities. Um, uh, I mean, colleges in Scotland make a very important contribution and a very substantial contribution to the delivery of higher education. And I think that should be preserved. Uh, I think there are uh, many people south of the border who might feel the pendulum has swung too far and universities have become too dominant an element. Uh, and that has added to uh, a downgrading potentially of more vocation orientated institutions. So the university, of course, themselves, I mean, are very vocationally orientated. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's access to higher education rather than access to universities. Um, uh, I think we should um, respect the contribution colleges make, and in many ways it's appropriate. Of course, I think we should be worried if it appears that the social composition of students in universities is very different from that in colleges. Um, but I have to say, I think you would find that in, also in England, that the social composition of the uh, uh, more traditional universities would be very different from that of the post-92 universities, which of course represent a much larger section of the university sector in England than they do in Scotland. Um, so we should be concerned that there are not barriers Equally, we should not say that the only desirable outcome is a, a kind of honours degree from a university. I think there are many other desirable outcomes of higher education. On that, that cultural point, that there, there's a, a culture that parents would see, in, in some situations, some sections of society, parents would see their child getting an HND or an HNC as, as lesser than getting their honours degree. What is your role? How do you perceive your role in shifting that culture? Well, uh, I think the major thing I can do is uh, not to be focused too strongly just on the university's contribution uh, and to um, uh, give greater recognition of what colleges can deliver and do deliver um, without in any way diminishing the kind of ease of articulation, the ease of transfer from one to the other if that's appropriate. Um, who knows, it might be appropriate to transfer in the other direction in certain occasions. Um, um, it's very difficult. Um, uh, the amount that one person can contribute to changing a culture, I think, always has to be limited. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dan. 
that start with a, a, a supplementary to the, the, the questions about um, contextualised submission. You said there's a need to make it plainer for, for learners. And indeed, I think you need to know whether or not you've got the grades or not. And there's a danger with contextualised submission that actually you, you, that becomes less obscure. I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate on what you think needs to happen to make it plainer for learners. Well, I think it's... I mean, I think it's true that universities, although, of course, they will all publish tariffs in terms of UCAS points for each subject, what they require to, for entry, uh, in practice, universities do vary those. Um, and they do take into account prior educational experience and social ex circumstances to some degree. They may also traditionally have taken into account other things, which may have even intensified privilege rather than diminished it. Um, uh, I think it's important that uh, people should understand what factors have been taken into account or will be taken into account. Not so that they can, they can then aggressively game the system in terms of their own CV. I mean, that's the risk, of course. Um, but that they, uh, that, that they have full knowledge of, of the factors that might be taken into account and the weight that might be attached to them. Um, I think that's fair to people. I think it's also fair um, to someone who, in a sense, has achieved higher grades, who doesn't get a place. I think it needs to be, you help, they need to be helped to understand why the university actually chose another person who apparently had a lower tariff point than they did, um, because these other factors were taken into account. So I think it's fair on both sides. Um, I mean, there are a number of factors which I can be taken into account, and, and I think it might vary between institutions, and I think it might vary between subjects. Um, uh, there are some subjects, frankly, in which uh, I think prior detailed um, educational experience in quite a technical sense is absolutely required. There are other subjects in which it is, frankly, less necessary. Um, so all this should be brought out, I think. Right? But the important thing is so that the person applying to university has a better understanding of how they are going to be their application is going to be judged. And I suspect often now, apart from UCAS points, it's pretty opaque. Thank you. I think that's absolutely right, and I look forward to future work on that. Mm. Um, in your written submission, you, you mentioned the, the need to look at, across what's happening in other parts of the UK. We obviously recently had the Diamond Review in Wales, which, as its starting point, really looks at kind of sustainable levels of, of student income while they're studying as being a, a really critical starting point, which I think I think is quite interesting and quite different. What do you think the lessons of the Diamond Review are for, for us here in Scotland, and, and what, how much will you be looking at student support? Um, well that, that is an area I don't particularly cover in my written statement, um, but I think the Diamond Review is a very interesting experiment. To some degree, it was uh, a change of policy was forced upon the Welsh Government because the policy they had of subsidising fees um, was probably not financially sustainable. It also led to what appeared to be a, a large outflow of resources to English institutions, um, uh, which, as you can imagine, Welsh institutions who felt they should have benefited from that uh, objected to. Um, so there are particular circumstances why that um, uh, the previous approach uh, had been uh, needed to be uh, modified. Um, nevertheless, I think it's interesting to emphasise student support um, uh, uh, rather than um, uh, uh, either higher fees with fee waivers and loans as in England or free tuition as it applies in Scotland. Um, my instinct is there's no right model um, and in a way I think it's useful to be able across the United Kingdom to look at different ways of approaching this and their different impacts potentially on fair access. Um, uh, but I return to one of the points I made in my written statement and that I think fair access or rather inequality of access reflects much deeper cultural and social factors. Um, and regardless of the particular funding arrangements you might have or even whether a student numbers are capped or are not capped, um, I think those inequalities persist and need to be addressed. Um, and just one final comment. Um, I think the experience from England has been that to approach this purely in terms of uh, financial 
incentives, pro providing bursaries to students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, that that often is an intervention which comes too late, um, and we need to address these issues much earlier, and that outreach activities, bridging programs, summer schools, all the things that we've talked about earlier this morning um, are actually more effective than a, a, a financial incentive of some kind. Equally, you should make sure, of course, that people, there are no financial barriers to participation as far as possible. I, 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 I quite agree with those set of assumptions. I think there is a wide set of uh, factors at, at play, but, and I think, but I think affordability, while people are studying, is, is a very important one. And on that basis, what, what do you see, or, or what role, indeed, have you discussed in terms of your participation uh, in the, the, the student support review that, that has uh, been announced? Well, I, I mean, I know that one of the recommendations made in the commission report was that um, within, I think, three months, um, work should be commissioned on the implications, the impact of student funding and support on fair access. My instinct today is that um, it might be premature to uh, rush into that, um, although clearly it's an extremely important factor. Okay. And just finally, I mean, what... What impact do you think the prospect of student debt has in terms of both in terms of perceptions um, and and then indeed kind of in terms of encouraging or otherwise people to actually go to university? Um, well, you could say we are engaged in a gigantic experiment south of the border in relation to this. Um, but equally, of course, in Scotland and in Wales, uh, people graduate and they have they have levels of debt. I mean, uh, it's lower than it would be in uh, England, but it still exists. Um, uh, and I think we still have a rather um, insecure understanding of perceptions of debt, particularly by younger people. Um, uh, uh, so far, the evidence is that for many young people, uh, debt is perhaps not as intimidating a prospect as it probably was for me when I was younger. Um, so I think um, uh, circumstances change in that respect. On the other hand, I think we need to have a better understanding of perceptions of debt among different social groups. I think there are some people who are probably much readier to accept and not worry about debt and see how it might be funded and, and pay back. Uh, there are other people who clearly, perhaps because they lack that self-confidence, um, it's a much more intimidating prospect. So I think it's much more about perceptions of debt than... than uh, equally, I don't think um, uh, it's fair to expect someone to graduate from university with effectively uh, a second mortgage already uh, to pay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Thank you very much. Daniel Johnson's touched on the majority of questions because I have the, the Diamond Report here um, and, and met with Serene um, recently. Um, I suppose my question, um, to not cover the ground that Daniel has, is <clears throat> the report was quite clear that um, in moving from sort of the tuition-free grant towards improved maintenance support arrangements um, for, for undergraduate students, um, particularly those with the highest level of grant support covering the full cost of maintenance, so for all their sort of their, their living costs, um, they... Uh, said that they felt that this could help support widen access as well as retention. Um, and would you reflect on that as part of the report, the annual report that you bring forward? In terms of when we are looking at learning best practice from the unique, across other parts of the UK, rather than that just be something which is, is just covered in this committee, be maybe something that you would reflect on uh, as you go forward and as you report back to, to government? Uh, I certainly would, yes. I mean, I think that's a key aspect. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being a bit tentative. I think it's simply that I don't want to uh, um, uh, claim understanding I don't currently have. Um, uh, and I think this is probably uh, the area in which I have most to learn. Um, but I agree. I think this is a key area. Um, I think comparisons across uh, the UK are very valuable. I would certainly keep in touch um, and I already know and have met um, my approximate uh, uh, equivalent in England, the director of the Office for Fair Access, um, uh, who's a former colleague. Um, uh, and I think certainly I will share as far as possible um, any lessons that could be learnt equally, I think, in the case of Wales. I think the, the Diamond Reviews, as I said, an extremely interesting experiment, although at a very early stage, um, and that might yield very interesting information as well. 
So I will certainly address that topic in my annual report. Yes, I, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. And, and something that was quite interesting about the report was actually the reaction from students as well that seemed to, to welcome a lot of the suggestions. Um, and you've already preempted <laughs> one of my questions in, in response to um, Liz Smith. So I do take that sort of a, as, as a genuine commitment that um, when you feel that maybe policy isn't always achieving the objectives it's, it's set to achieve, that you'll be fairly robust in, in highlighting that to, to government. Um, Yes, I'm very determined to maintain my independence. Um, all I can say is if, uh, if the uh, Scottish Government have any doubt on that uh, uh, count, um, they have not uh, done their preparatory work very satisfactorily, because I think I have a reputation for being independent. Um, equally, I hope I will be sensitive. Um, I think my role should be challenging, but also very supportive and very respectful of the work that is currently being done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Tilling, did you have a supplementary? You just say that the, the task that you've got before you surely is made significantly easier given that Scottish students wanting to go into university do not have the burden of potential debt by having student fees. And that's one barrier that's been removed that actually does have an effect on the people that we're trying to target getting into university. Sorry, could you just... Yeah, so we, we, we have a you have a situation where you're dealing um, with widening access in a country that does not put tuition fees on its students for higher education. Would you agree that that's actually going to make the widening access agenda easier to achieve? Um, I would say in very broad historical terms, um, providing free um, tuition uh, does on balance uh, produce fairer access. Um, but it's by no means a simple equation. Um, and I think it would be a great mistake for anyone to conclude, and I don't think anyone in Scotland is concluding this, that simply because tuition for Scottish students is free, that somehow that has solved the problem. Um, uh, there are many, many other issues which I say address, have other sources. Um, but I, have, I think I have no doubt um, that that is the right starting point. Um, I have to say uh, that even um, uh, um, re regardless of my own personal views, um, I think that that is the starting point and that has to be the starting point because it is the a policy of the Scottish Government um, and it has been the policy of the Scottish Government under different political administrations um, uh, since it was established. Um, uh, and in practice it would be very difficult to uh, move to a different kind of system. As conversely, it sadly, I would say, um, uh, it would be quite difficult uh, now in England to unscramble, retreat from a system which is dependent on charging high tuition fees. Um, and I think one has to accept that political reality. Uh, but in terms of my own personal beliefs, I think the Scottish approach um, is much more likely to promote fair access in the longer term than the approach of the English government acting as an English government, the UK government acting as an English government. Thank you. Please be no end to talk about independence and now about English <laughs> government. But, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm abusing my position as convener. Sorry, Liz. <laughs> uh, Joanne. Yeah, um, can I say, first of all, there was two things particularly said in your opening contribution in your papers that I really welcomed. The first one was to put it in context of a child, two children born, one with guaranteed, not guaranteed opportunity, but reality is the fact that for too many of our children, the life chances are determined by the time they're five. And I do hope that, where it may not be your particular remit, that you will continue to, to have that in your head, because I think it's so important in terms of government policy more generally and it's not going to be sorted by some kind of system of making it fairer for the ones who actually manage to get through the process but recognise that we lose so much potential all the way through the system. But the second thing I really welcomed was the fact that you said your work would be evidence-led because my contention that education policy in Scotland and evidence-led policy are completely different things and I would hope that you would you know, um, recognise that. And we've just heard it around the question of tuition fees. And I, and I, I note your personal view, and you've said, but I wonder if you are still open to the fact that you would look at that policy in terms of its perhaps unintended consequences. Because if you're looking at it in terms of evidence, 
First of all, the universities tell us it's underfunded. Secondly, um, it's cross-subsidised from fortunately having students coming from across the border who do pay fees. Thirdly, um, it's rationed by a quota. There's a cap on the system. And I'm told it's more difficult for a young person in Scotland to go into university now than it was five years ago, ten years ago, precisely because of our system um, of funding. And it's funded at a consequence of cuts to college education. And I wonder, do you have a role in looking at that evidence and either saying, if you want to call it free education, you're going to have to put more money in, or you're going to have to recognise there's a balance there if the resources remain the same? Um, uh, yes, I think to some degree I can make those points. Um, equally, I think I have to accept, and I do accept, that these are political decisions that the, the, the Scottish Government has to uh, establish its own priorities. Um, uh, and has been elected on that basis. Um, I think all, I naturally, of course, would argue for increased expenditure on higher education um, uh, and education more generally. Um, but I'm very aware there are people who think the National Health Service or other, other uh, areas might be of priority. Um, uh, so although I think additional resources would be very welcome, uh, I think realistically we have to accept there's always going to be some limit on what resources are available, uh, and the choices in terms of priorities are ultimately political ones. Um, uh, you mentioned the cap on student numbers. Um, I, uh, I know there's quite a focus on that in Scotland in terms of the impact it might have in terms of displacing students, um, Scottish students. Um, uh, um, but I've tried to emphasise that I think, in a sense, that there are always going to be constraints on capacity in any system. So issues like displacement um, uh, notionally, logically, can arise uh, in all circumstances, I think. Um, uh, I also should point out that um, uh, it's only this year that the cap on student numbers in England has been fully removed. It's very early days to see how that will work. Um, uh, so to imagine, I think, that simply by removing the cap or raising the cap significantly, that that will solve all of our problems in relation to fair access. Um, uh, but I absolutely accept that um, uh, we need additional resources. And I would, if I feel it's appropriate, make that argument. The um, argument is the way in which resources are shared. And of course, the capacity is there. It's just simply that Scottish students can't get those places because of, the under, because of the way in which the tuition fee policy operates. And I should add that actually our young people are the most indebted, disadvantaged students in Scotland are more indebted than in other parts of the United Kingdom. But you say that's a political decision. Is it not your job to challenge political decisions that are not evidence-based? But if I, if, if, you no, know, people I will, I, there will I, be a contention about what I've said around the evidence. Mm. But is it not your job to say, you know, you're defining, you're describing this as one thing, which is free tuition. In fact, the consequence of it means there are other consequences, particularly around access, I would contend. Is it not your job then to say, you may want to make that political decision, but you will make it in the knowledge that it's contrary to a policy on fair access and opportunity? Certainly my responsibility to... to point out the consequences of um, both the, the, the student cap and the level of overall funding. Um, uh, um, but the decision obviously lies elsewhere. Um, but no, I certainly think it's correct that I should point out the consequences and the evidence that supports the conclusions I've reached. I suppose really the, the, what I'm keen to hear from you is a recognition that a decision which has consequences in terms of access, ought not to have the credibility of a label of free education if it's counter to what we're looking at. I mean, it's and rather than simply saying, well, that's not a matter for me, that's a decision for government. Mm. I think I should look, certainly look across a very wide range of policies. Um, I, I think I end my written statement by saying you should try to make all policies sort of access proof. Um, you should evaluate even if it appears to be in an area comparatively remote from entry to higher education, you should try and make some kind of assessment of what the implications of that might be, positive or negative, in relation to fair access. Um, 
So I certainly think it's my responsibility to try and uh, increase the sensitivity across all areas of uh, Scottish Government to the impact of their policies in terms of fair access. Be fair, I mean, I, I think probably everybody here would want to be in a position to support what you have said, which is you value higher education for everyone and it, it's difficult to just see how that fits in with a tuition fees policy. Can I just, one last wee point on ground access. Will you be looking at um, the, the four-year degree in Scotland and its necessity? given that many young people now see that the first year of university is very similar to the sixth year at school? Mm. Well, I think it'd be, it would be very uh, bold to suggest a kind of total reconstruction of the pattern of undergraduate education in Scotland. Um, after all, we should recognise that Scotland is the standard across Europe and across the world. Uh, um, uh, it's England and Wales that are exceptional by having a shorter undergraduate degree. Um, but I do accept that uh, you do need to ensure that the kind of any overlap between final years in school and first years in university is managed uh, sensibly. Uh, there might be instances in which um, high performing students might be given some form of advanced standing. Um, uh, but in general terms, I think the fact that you have a four year uh, degree. Um, gives a flexibility in Scotland, um, which is not available in England, where you have a, a rather narrow range of possibilities. Um, I have to say, I don't think they've uh, always been, that flexibility has always been used, um, certainly in relation to articulation. Um, my understanding is that roughly half the students with higher nationals who then transfer to a university are given no credit, no advanced standing at all for that. Um, and in fact, the proportion uh, is rather lower in England, despite the fact that they would be effectively coming to perhaps the final year of degree programme rather than just year three. Um, so it should be easier to uh, manage articulation in Scotland than it is uh, in England, where there's a shorter degree programme. So I think um, uh, one should encourage a degree of flexibility, perhaps in some circumstances, a limited number of circumstances, by um, uh, allowing some form of advanced stud standing uh, even for first entry students from school. Um, I think certainly that flexibility should be used to improve articulation uh, and make it more common. Um, uh, but I don't think um, that it would be sensible for me or even uh, uh, to recommend um, any wholesale changes in, in that. Yeah. I think, it, on whole, I think it's a great advantage which should be used more, more commonly. Yeah. Thank you. Less supplementary. Uh, Professor Scott, could I just ask for a, a clarification on that, and notwithstanding the fact that, you know, obviously we all have different views about higher education funding, and not asking about that uh, difference of perspective. Given that your title is Commission for Fair Access, do you believe that within the current system, that there is a problem as a result of the fact that different categories of students, whether they're domiciled Scots, European, international, or rest of the UK, because of that categorization, do actually have um, different perspectives when it comes to the payment that they make for the university. Some are obviously paid for by the government, some are paid for by their own means. Does that concern you? And I'm not asking for views about the future of higher education funding, but does that concern you about fair access? And just to take up the point that Joanne Lamont uh, mentioned earlier, where by the competitive edge for the places, there's a knock-on effect for that competitive edge because of the cap system, which doesn't exist for some students. W would you actually look at that aspect of it? Yes, I think certainly we should be frank about that. Um, I, I, it's not a new problem, as I say in my written statement. I mean, it's, it's a problem in a sense that has existed for at least half a century in relation to students from outside the European Union. Um, uh, uh, but a new dimension of complexity has been created, I agree, um, uh, by the decisions, or, the, or rather the different decisions taken by the UK government and the Scottish government in relation to uh, tuition fees. Um, uh, so yes, that, that produces areas of which, of potential controversy, um, and they do produce areas of fair 
complication in relation to fair access. I see the primary responsibility of this uh, role, um, and I think it was the prime focus of the Commission, to focus on fair access for Scottish domiciled students. Um, uh, uh, I don't think I have any remit to um, uh, make access fairer for students who come from England or Wales and attend Scottish institutions, um, although I accept that the kind of social composition of those students does change the flavour and affect the, uh, the, the, the culture of at least some Scottish universities. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Econ. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'm just looking at some of the figures that uh, the NUS have been providing us with. And, look, and looking at the ancient universities, it says that only 6% of students at ancient universities come from deprived backgrounds, moving from college to university. There's 113 students quoted here uh, as being involved in this. 91 are made to start again in the first year. Does that, and 10 more are made to duplicate a year of study. Does that seem fair? Um. Well, on the face of it, it's not fair, um, but I think we always have to start from where we are rather than where we should be. Um, uh, and I have to say, I think if you went to uh, 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 the most famous American universities or Oxford or Cambridge, you would find a very similar pattern uh, that there would, on the whole, be a limited number of students from disadvantaged backgrounds, despite the great efforts those institutions make to search for those students uh, and to welcome them and to support them when they enter that institution. Um, uh, I think rather than commenting in detail on specific universities, I think I'd like to make the general point that I do think it's important that the um, uh, institutions with the most privileged social intakes um, have a responsibility, a kind of leadership role um, I don't think it's appropriate to say, well, this is taken care of by post-92 universities or colleges. Um, I think the responsibility is for the whole sector. And in a way, I think perhaps Edinburgh or St Andrews or whatever institutions you might have in mind maybe have a heightened responsibility to exercise some leadership in this area. I have to say, I think they... They do make major efforts. I mean, I was in St Andrews last week um, uh, talking to the new principal, and uh, they had organised a conference which brought together people concerned with fair access from across Scotland. Uh, and I was very impressed um, by their commitment, her personal commitment. Um, uh, uh, and I know that St Andrews do some, actually some, have some quite interesting programmes. Um, uh, um, so I wouldn't expect... Um, everyone to approach fair access in the same way, but the, st the statistic you give, yes, is a very alarming one. Looking at across all institutions, um, it says that 51% of articulating students are forced to repeat years of study, which seems a very high proportion. It does. It seems a high proportion to me, and as I said, I think it's a higher proportion than would be the case in England, despite the fact England has a shorter degree programme. Um, uh, I think there are two uh, areas of concern there. One is, of course, for the individual student. They are effectively prolonging their education, so issues of debt and worry about entering the labour market and so on and getting a job. Um, uh, they're worse for them if they're being forced unnecessarily to prolong their education. Um, and secondly, of course, it's um, uh, a waste that... Uh, um, if you're duplicating a funded place which could have been available to another student. So I think, I think more could be done to improve that. Um, I think sometimes uh, universities will start from the position that a higher national student is, is sort of guilty until proved innocent. It has to be proved that the uh, experience they've had in their two years articulate sufficiently well with the university programme for them to be allowed on. I think we should try and shift that round and say, um, on the whole, it's innocent until proved guilty. That on the starting point should be that 
you should be given advance standing and appropriate credit for that unless there are compelling educational reasons um, in relation to particular subjects why that's not appropriate. And, of course, there will be midway positions. But. In the interests of fairness, is this an area that you would be very much looking at? Yes, I think, I think articulation between colleges and universities, um, which I would have expected the uh, performance in Scotland to be superior than in other parts of the United Kingdom, actually appears on the face of it to be rather less good. So I think it's an area that one could work on. Groups like the NUS say that articulation is a success story, but clearly behind it there are other issues that perhaps need to be addressed and looked at in the interests of this widening access and fairness of access. Yes, no, I agree. Thank you very much. Fulton, you wanted to come in? Uh, thanks, convener, and um, welcome uh, to your post, Professor Scott, and I wish you a uh, lot going forward. I think that um, this has been a very interesting um, discussion today. Um, I, I suppose um, a lot of the points have been covered, but I suppose what I would like to uh, stress again and ask you is, is you know, um, a similar question to what I mentioned in the, the previous panel. Um, for me, it's about making sure that, that people have choices. So I think there is, and it was, it was raised, I think, by Tavish Scott uh, already, that maybe there's a, an almost an obsession with university. Um, or even college or further education as a whole. But I think what I would like to see is that people, um, you know, young people across the country have got choices and that, you know, that they, 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 whatever they choose, they feel that they're on an even keel with everybody else. And I know you've talked about it and um, you've answered it in different parts from specific points to other members, but I wonder what your overall thoughts are taking that forward. In the um. Well, I certainly think you're absolutely right that um, uh, you shouldn't indicate that there are, um, there are standard ways of success and there are routes which are inherently less successful. Uh, and I would certainly resist very strongly um, any suggestion that uh, a college experience or the courses uh, and qualifications gained through a college are somehow inferior to those gained in the university. I think that would be wrong. Um, I think the key, though, is to make sure that people have the correct information to make choices. Uh, I think that people start from the same position so they have the same chance of realizing, or reasonably as similar chances, of realizing the choices they would like to make, that they are realistic choices for them, um, uh, as I say, to level the playing field. But I think it would be very unfortunate in the process of pursuing fair access, you narrowed down the choices that were available to people. Uh, because my guess is that looking uh, into the future, there will be a proliferation of different pathways that students might follow, uh, apprenticeship modes of various kinds, um, uh, um, um, a whole range. So I think we have a much more diverse range of pathways that people follow. So fair access shouldn't be narrowed down too much to success in a particular way. Yeah, and, and have you got any um, scope or, or plans to, to do any work with the sort of the business uh, community or, you know, through the, the you know, apprenticeships, the modern <coughs> apprenticeship scheme, anything like that? Is that, is that on your radar to, to look at as well? Well, I think it certainly should be on my radar, yes. Um, and I, as I said, I think I should um, try to resist as fast as possible seeing fair access simply in terms of access to universities and maybe to particular kinds of university. Um, uh, that's important, but that's only one aspect of fair access. Um, fair access, as you say, is um, uh, trying as far as possible to respect the choices that students might make if they're following less traditional routes. Um, uh, one thing, it's not at all a criticism of the uh, Commission's report, which I think is a wonderful document in most respects, um, but it is focused very strongly on younger initial entrants. Um, uh, and I think mature students, adult students, um, and part-time students, people because of their circumstances, need to study in a more flexible way. Um, uh, they also need to be addressed, so yes. 
Yeah, no. I think in a way I, I need to try and cover as much as possible, but also I need to be realistic about it. Uh, I mean, it's clear there are certain agendas uh, that people wish to see progress on, and the Scottish Government has established some targets, which uh, it, and of course, the Funding Council itself, in terms of outcome agreements, establishes effectively targets for institutions to meet. Um, but I don't think we should be too constrained by these particular targets. I think we should try and see fair access in a very broad and open kind of way. And I appreciate that those were very broad questions, but I also yeah, acknowledge that you're, you're just in post, and I do actually genuinely look forward to perhaps you've been back in front of the committee at uh, some point in the future, and, and when you've had more time to uh, develop in the role, and, uh, and, and I'll be keenly interested to see how, how that's going. No, no, I recognise I'm very uh, uh, clear that I'm offering very general answers um, to answers that really should be much more specific. And I certainly need, I think, to think hard about, certainly in the first year, the areas I should focus on. Um, and I would hope to determine three or four areas I'd like to focus on um, uh, and make that publicly known. Um, that those are the areas I intend to focus on um, uh, without losing, I think, a sense of the need to encourage a kind of debate about what fair access means. Thank you very much, Professor Scott. I'm sure that the next time we have you back, we'll be asking you questions about those particular areas of interest. Uh, that closes this, the, the public session. Can I thank Professor Scott for his time and his evidence? and wish him well in his new post. Thank you.